Okay. <clears throat> So, we have today obtained this precious human life, precious human life, precious human life. We call this life precious human life, not so much because of it is agility. Not so much because of other skills like other animals have. We call this life precious human life <clears throat> primarily because of we have this amazing human intelligence. But this intelligence itself is just a potential. It is very much dependent upon us whether you use it for positive constructive side or for negative destructive side. If you use this mind for positive constructive side, then this life really is called precious human life. Then like Mahatma Gandhi, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela, so many, who even though are like us, just one individual, but they are able to benefit so many millions of people, like Buddha, is not living here anymore, but he has over 500 million followers who call themselves as a Buddhist. And also there are many who don't claim to be Buddhist, but who very much appreciate the Buddhist teaching of interdependent origination and nonviolence. Right? So one person can make huge difference in the lives of not only human beings, but animals, all sentient beings, as we say it. Contrarily, there are people who use the same human potential in the negative side, just like Hitler, Mao Zedong, Stalin, Idi Amin, long list. I have a list of these people, how many people died under them? I have a list. So again, one person, but can bring so much destruction and suffering, right? So therefore, the purpose of human life is to bring happiness in one's own life and also in the life of other people. Otherwise, this precious human life is a big waste. Right? So therefore, it is important to make a commitment that I will make my life meaningful in the sense of bringing happiness in one's own life in the life of many other people. Now this thing called happiness has be, is becoming a rare commodity. Not, not many people are achieving it. We are running not for happiness, but we are running for pleasure. We are primarily pleasure seekers. Use our five senses and run towards the five sensual, five or six sensual objects. Right? And that's why we are busy today. That's why everybody is running. Running not so much in the pursuit of, we, we can say that we are running in the pursuit of happiness, but in the true sense of the term, we are primarily running for immediate sensual pleasures. 
And immediate sensual pleasures will never give us long lasting happiness. Sensual pleasures are experienced by senses, not so much by the mental consciousness. So when we engage in spiritual practice, especially Buddhist practice, what we need to do is involve our mind. It's, it's wonderful that you go around the temple, circumambulate, make prostrations. These are also good, but these are primarily related to your physical activities. So when you do this physical and verbal positive practices, it is important that you involve your mind. Because the virtuous practices that you do related to your body will not go to the next life. You'll die with this life, die with this body. So what is important therefore is to involve your mind, especially the subtle mind, which goes to the next life. Right? So involve the subtle mind. That's why meditation becomes important. Is it clear? This is very important to remember. Involve your mental consciousness and especially subtle mental consciousness. And that you can do through meditation, through mindfulness. That's why meditation is important. As I mentioned yesterday, meditation basically means making your mind habituated with virtuous practices. Why? Because we are controlled by our mind. Is that clear? Are we controlled by primarily controlled by our body or our mind? Make it, make it sure. Huh? Our mind. Our mind is our boss. So if our mind is our boss, what kind of mind do you, do, you really need? What kind of, in other words, what kind of boss you would like to have? A gentle, honest, far-sighted, intelligent boss, or crooked, stupid, huh? terrorizing boss. What kind of boss you want? It's, it's common sense that we will all say, I want a good boss. I, I want to walk under a good boss. That, that's what we normally say. Right? So therefore, your mind is your boss. You are controlled by your mind. That is not a big issue. But the issue is, if you are controlled by your mind, now you need to see what kind of mind is controlling you. What kind of boss is controlling you? If it is uneducated, and especially negative, destructive, short-sighted, foolish, stupid, then it is completely sure that you will go in the wrong path. So, so Buddhist, when we talk about Buddhist practice, we are really talking about selecting a good boss, just as we do in the election. During election, of course it varies from country to country, but normally during election we have at least two parties, the ruling party and the oppo opposition party. Right? So similarly, in our system of mind also we have two parties. Party of positive emotions, party of negative emotions. Now, now we should see which one has a, an upper hand right now. Which one has an upper hand? Are you primarily, dominantly ruled by the negative emotion party or positive emotion party? Be honest. I can't say. This, I can't talk about the state of your mind. But you should be fair to yourself and see which one is ruling us. Which party got 
landslide majority and ruling. It looks, it seems that we are, I'm not, I, 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 it's not fair to say completely, but I can probably say that we are predominantly controlled by the negative emotions like anger, jealousy, attachment, hatred, and the host of other emotions. You are primarily controlled by that. Now when you are controlled by this host of negative emotions, as I already mentioned, it is pretty much sure that you are going to have, going to make a mess of your life. Like for example, anger. When you are controlled by anger, what happens? When you are controlled by anger, what do you, what do you mean by becoming angry? When you, when you get angry, you become, you become intelligent. <laughs> they do that, there's a lot of seats here also. When you get angry, When you get angry, you become mad. What, what is the definition of a mad person? Mad person is dead person. Mad person is dead person who has no sense of discrimination, who has no sense of what is good, what is bad. That person because of madness will say anything that comes in the mind, to anything that comes in, you know, in his mind. So that's why normally we say, oh, that person is crazy, he's mad, don't go there. That's what we say. So unfortunately, in a sense, we are all mad. We are mad of negative emotions. I mean, that's a different level, especially when we get angry, right? So what I'm trying to point out is when we talk about distancing ourselves from the negative emotions and making friendship with the positive emotions, we need to clearly know how destructive these negative emotions are. Don't just say these are destructive because it is said by Buddha or His Holiness Dalai Lama or whoever, but you should with an unbiased mind see scientifically if you want to use that word, analyze whether these destructive emotions like anger are really necessary. So with all of these negative emotions, we can undertake a research and weigh the pros and the cons, right? There are occasions when you get angry, then you think that by getting angry, I get an special added energy that, that makes me bored, that makes me say things that I'm normally unable to say, do things that I'm normally unable to do. You get that boldness. That, that is perhaps the only, that is perhaps the only criteria or goodness of anger. But that extra energy that you get when you get angry is essentially Blind energy. And therefore, it's unsure whether you will hit the target or not. So what I'm saying, the, saying is that only this only seemingly positive aspect also is not really positive in that sense. Then, as far as the negative side of anger is concerned, there are so many. I may not be able to say everything, but you should really sit down and find it for yourself. Number one, when you get angry, you get ugly. I'm 100% sure nobody wants to become ugly. Right? That's why we comb our hair, you know, use all the cosmetics, you know, things like that. Make sure your color, color is right. Right? But then get angry, even after decorating yourself with all the gold earrings and so many things, 
After that, you get angry, you know. You don't look any more handsome or beautiful or pretty. You, you really look horrible. You become an ornamented demon then. Right? Right? Then, like, like, take the example, like he's holding this Dalai Lama. He don't use any of these ornaments, but probably one of the most handsome person in the world. Because of calmness, compassion, loving kindness, that is inside him. When, when you have this <coughs> positive inner qualities like compassion and so forth, the Buddha himself clearly says in his text that when you have this calmness in your mind, calmness within, then there is a proper flow of energy. With the proper flow of energy, there is a proper flow of the blood, blood, proper blood circulation. Blood circulation will take place all of your body, including your faces. When there is a proper flow of blood on your face, your face becomes radiant. Your cheek also becomes reddish. You see? Right? When you don't have this inner calmness and peace, it doesn't really matter however much heavy cosmetics you put on your face, you will see pimples rising from here, there, everywhere, you know, because of anger, jealousy, hatred, unhappiness, and things like that. And then see, you have to spend a lot of money for these external decorations. And many of these external material accumulations are actually invitation to thieves and robbers. The more there is a Tibetan saying which says, the heavier your load, the more it is inviting the thieves. You see? Now these days thieves means not ordinary thieves, it may be income tax office, <laughs> it may be bank, whatever, you know. Do you lose your money? With a slight turmoil in the economical system, you lose all your money, you see. Right? So therefore, <coughs> the only way to make you handsome, beautiful, sane, calm, stable, is developing these inner qualities. As I mentioned, I, I mentioned yesterday also, I want to repeat this also, now people are really worried what will happen to the world in the next 40, 50 years. There will be drastic and dramatic change of everything because of the speed of science and technology. As I mentioned yesterday, artificial intelligence, you know, then megawars, metawars, and what, whatever, you know, there are so many things which I even don't know. They will even try to manipulate your brain. The very meaning of your personality may change, right? When the whole system changes, how are you going to cope with that? You will be able to cope with all those only if you have developed these internal resources to fight with. I also mentioned yesterday that during the pandemic, the one thing that really become useful is people who have inner resources, they are able to deal with those, those fears of pandemic and so forth. And many of them, they were saying, oh, the pandemic was personally for me, it was a blessing in disguise. No problem with me. I, I got a lot of time to, you know, remain in meditation, do my practice and things like that. In my own case, because I don't have to go to the office, I read this big book, Shanti Deva's Bodhichara Avatara. I read seven commentaries of that book during that time and made, made notes and things like that, you know. It's really a wonderful period. But then for the majority who don't have these internal resources, who always relied upon their happiness to external amenities, they found it very difficult. So whether you like it or not, this is the bitter truth, that whether you like it or not, if you are to face a pandemic again, if you are to face, I'm not just saying you are to, you will face many more kind of troubles, ups and downs in life, death of your relatives, friends. These are natural things, you know. Nobody can, nobody can avoid and escape those things. These are natural occurrences. But we suffer because we are not ready to accept the natural occurrences. 
Therefore, I repeatedly tell people, you must properly understand the law of nature, respect the law of nature, live in harmony with that. Then your life will shine out. You will never face any problem. Like for example, for example, you know, we feel very sad when one of our very close friends or relatives die, right? Why do we feel so sad? There may be many reasons. But one big reason is to your untrained mind, you thought that I'm going to live with this person forever. I'm going to live forever. This person is going to live forever. And then suddenly it doesn't happen. Then you get shocked. Oh my God, what's happening? You see? The problem with this kind of thinking, with this kind of wrong thinking is, when you start thinking that I'm going to live forever, my, my beloved friends are going to live forever, then there is a lot of time to fight, to create misunderstanding, to get angry, you know, things. That's what we are, we are doing. When we are living together, we are not so nice to each other. We don't take very good care of each other, right? And when somebody dies, then we shed our crocodile tears. I call it crocodile tears. Meaning, we do all kinds of useless things because of lack of understanding. Contrarily, if you have proper understanding, and especially the understanding that this person is with me, I don't know how long. This person called my husband, my wife, my beloved husband, my beloved wife, my beloved brother, sister, whoever. I really don't know how, they are, how long I'm going to live, how long he is going to live, she is going to live how long we are going to live together. Completely uncertain. Now, in such an uncertain situation, the best course of thing is, right now I'm living. Right now my brother is living, sister is living. Be nice to each other. Have fun. Be happy, go for a picnic, whatever. Be happy. As far as happiness is concerned, people say, if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you, have been, if you want happiness for a day, go for a picnic, right? If you want happiness for a month, get married. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there, there, there are a lot of you know, interesting things, how to get happiness, okay? And then investing and things like that. So my main point is, happiness is not something that you you know, chase and chase and chase, then suddenly, oh, here is the happiness, you catch it and hold it with, no. Happiness is a state of your mind. Happiness means mental satisfaction. Mental satisfaction. In your day-to-day -day life, even in one day, you do something really good, beneficial to other people, you get satisfied. That's called happiness, yes. My day was useful. Yes, I did this. Yes, I did this. Yes, I made this person happy. I was able to make at least three, four people happy today, honestly speaking. That's what I do. That's my job, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I may be making them unhappy, but normally I'm able to make them happy. <laughs> and then you get satisfaction, you see. You don't need to get any money or, you know, gift and things like that from other people. Genuine satisfaction. There are so many people, good people, you know, looking for good things, not being able to find it, not being able to find the path. And because of your age, your spiritual experience, whatever, you know, we all have that experience. Share it with a genuine concern, unconditional love as we say it. Share it, they will get benefit. This is how the society progresses. This is how the society can take care of each other. Right? Whatever job you do, doesn't really matter so long it is beneficial. We need to, you know, <clears throat> do all kinds of jobs to benefit people <clears throat> in many, many ways. So that's the thing, right? So, so therefore, just like a scientist, just like a researcher, see the positive effects of positive emotions, negative effects of negative emotions, and then practice and meditation means distancing yourself from the negative emotions. Making friendship with the positive emotions. Now, for example, if you spend, say, one day or two days, or if needed, one month, do a research on anger. 
what does the Buddhist text say about anger? What does the Western philosophy say about anger? What the Western science say about anger? What is my own personal experience of anger? Right? We are all, we are all, we all have that experience of getting angry on one day or the other. So let us recall all those experiences and see how much of this ang anger have contributed to your well-being. And then write a book. Why not? If not, at least write an article. We can all do that. That's what is really needed. The purpose is through that research, through this analysis, you call it meditation or not, doesn't make difference, but you are basically meditating through that process. Medit meditation is of two types. One-pointed meditation, analytical meditation. So this one is analytical meditation, analyze. And through that, when you are able to develop the conviction, yes, anger is bad. Yes, anger makes me ugly. Yes, anger increases my blood pressure. Yes, the worst thing, the yes, anger makes me mad. Yes, because of anger, there is a road accident. You know, in America, I have a book published in America. Even in terms of economical expenses, America loses billions of dollars because of anger. Not just talking about, you know, Nirvana enlightenment in this very life. Because when you get angry, then you, you know, do this mad drive, and there are cases of shooting each other, you see, accident, there's so many cases, and people committing suicide, this and that, you know. So not only for the future life, in this very life, these negative emotions are very, very destructive. So likewise attachment, likewise unchecked desire, things like that. So that's what I would like to request all of you to do that. Because no amount of teaching will make you any difference if you personally don't analyze it. If you're personally not able to develop conviction, it will not make much difference in your life. So therefore, in the Buddhist system of practice, we have this threefold process of study, threefold process of practice, which is called, number one is called listening. And second is called thinking or contemplation. And third is called meditation. Thursam gomsum. Thursam gomsum. Now, why these three steps are necessary? These three steps are necessary. Let me give you an example. For example, <coughs> if you are <coughs> very thirsty, looking for water, have no idea where water is available, then you need to, number one, hear from somebody where water is available. Ask somebody, I'm dying with this thirst, you know, can I get water somewhere? Then somebody says, okay, you can get water, but you have to walk two kilometers from here. So that, that listening or hearing or getting that information where water is available is important, right? Because you have no idea where is water is available. At least now you have some sense where water is available. But does, does that, will that quench your thirst? It's good, it's big progress, but it will not quench your thirst. You, you are yet to drink water. So what do you need to do? You need to walk two kilometers. Because that fellow said, what is available at two kilometers. So walk two kilometers. Walk two kilometers. So, so the second step is called thinking. It's not enough to, to listen to somebody, hear the teaching. After listening to the teaching, after hearing the teaching, you need to do your homework and think and contemplate how far this teaching seems right. Related to your personal experience, your common sense, scientific findings, whatever, and try to find out the truth of this teaching, of the Buddha, of His Holiness, of any other great teacher, think about it. Then through this thinking, when you find that, yes, as far as my capacity to think is concerned, this really seems to be true, that will, develop, that will help you develop the conviction, yes, it is. You made a big, big, big progress now. It's like walking two kilometers. And you finally reach near the water. It's like really reaching near the water. Big progress. But still, still you have, you have not 
drunk the water. You are yet to drink the water, right? It's a big progress. You are certain, you are sure about the efficacy of that, that practice, but still, you have not quenched your thirst. So what you need to do, the third step is, you need to bow down, use your hand or cup or any you know, pot you have, and then drink the water. It's only by drinking the water your thirst will be quenched. Not just by listening, not just by, you know, contemplation. These two first two steps are very important. Right? Right? So similarly, 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 you need to, uh, in terms of your practice also, meditation means making it part of your life. Making it a part of life. For example, if you study about compassion, there are three types of compassion. This is the definition of compassion. And so many things you study. And then you also see the usefulness, importance of compassion. Right? You develop the conviction about the importance of compassion. But, but if somebody asks you, do you have the compassion? I don't have the compassion. I don't have the compassion. So when you don't have the compassion, it will not serve any purpose. It will not serve any purpose. So therefore, it is important to, to really uh, develop that compassion. I ask the question, do I have the compassion or not? If not, make sure that you have it. So for that, you need to practice that compassion repeatedly. In the beginning, by contriving, by making effort, then gradually you will reach that effortless stage when you don't have to make any effort. Right? So that is the process. That is the process. So what I'm trying to say is, when we talk about all these positive qualities, we need to make an effort to really have these qualities with us. These qualities are not for talking, not just for getting an idea about it, which may be useful to share with others, but, but uh, it will not do any good unless you develop that. Now to develop that, it will take time. You need to make repeated effort. Short-lived attempt will not take you anywhere. You need to make repeated effort. But the interesting and good thing is, as Shantideva says in his Bodhisattva way of life, there is nothing that will not become easier if you practice it. There's nothing that will not become easier if you practice it. Just like, just like the gymnasts, you know. People who do long jump, you know, you know, play all kinds of sports, daredevil sports, everybody does, you know. For us, it's almost impossible. But it's possible because these people are doing it. Provided if you put that right stamina and motivation and practice it regularly, you can do. I'll give you one example. The story of a mother and a baby, kind of baby, young baby, girl. So the mother had a, had a buffalo. So she used to milk that uh, buffalo. And uh, the little kid will take care of that little baby of the buffalo, you know, calf, calf. And then with the passage of time, you know, the baby, the, the human baby also becoming bigger. And then this, this calf of the buffalo also becoming bigger. <coughs> But every time, she, every day she used to take it out, to take it out. And it happened that when, when she grew up as a woman, big woman, she was able to lift that buffalo easily. It's a wonderful example they mentioned in the text. But you need to do it every day. I mean, this makes complete sense because if it is something that you can lift today, it will not happen that you are unable to lift it tomorrow, you see. If you, you know, don't do it for many, many years, maybe you will not be able to do it. But if you do it regularly, you will be able to do it. So, so you, you, you can become a weightlifting champion very easily, like that, if you do it regularly. For most of us, there's a Tibetan saying which says, for one day you're so excited, that you even forget to take your food and you are really after the pursuit of spiritual practice, Buddhist meditation. 
Lama Thani Kepe compound, as, as soon as you start studying something, you want to become a scholar on Buddhist teachings, you know. Such person will never get anything because after three days they will forget everything. So therefore you must make effort just like a running river. The running river, running river will not stop in the day, not stop in the night, it will continue to flow. So similarly you should make effort regularly. That's why many of the Buddhist teachers, especially if you re receive a tantric teaching, at the end of the tantric teaching they will give you some commitments, vows. And the commitment very often says, recite this prayer, meditate on this six times in a day. Right? And people used to ask me this question, Geshe-la, why don't why do we have to do this six times a day? So in the beginning I had no answer. But then I thought about it, now I have an answer. Hopefully this is the correct answer. Now, now these days when people ask me such a question, then I say, yeah, first, first of all, you tell me how many times you eat in a day. You see? For your body, you need to eat so many times. At least lunch, breakfast, dinner, and in between Kit Kat, you know, so many things. Tea break or whatever, so many things. So similarly, it makes sense for the spiritual development. Also, you need to do not necessarily six, but as many as possible. This is important because much of the problem that we see in the world today is clear indication of starvation of human mind. Starvation of human mind. Because it's the mind which is the in invisible energy. And we do talk about our mind, but there's hardly any nourishment any spiritual food that we give to the mind, right? So therefore the mind is starving. And I jokingly tell people we are very good in updating our machines, mobile phones, we keep on updating, you know, now everybody's looking for iPhone 14, you know, provided they have some money in their pocket. Everybody wants to update the external machines but I, I, in a teasing way, I tell people, okay, it's good you keep on updating your you know, external machines, but when was the last time you updated yourself? You see? So Buddhist practice means update yourself. Remove the negative ways of thinking, short-sighted ways of thinking. Develop a more holistic. There cannot be a holistic thinking better than thinking about all sentient beings. That is the, the most important teaching in Buddhism. And when we cultivate this mind called bodhicitta, the very definition of this mind is how nice if I achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. I mean, imagine for the benefit of all sentient beings. We are very pr proud of talking about globalization. Talking and thinking about globalization is a big thing, you see. We, are, we, we talk about a global village globalization. But this so-called globalization and global village is talking only about human beings. In Buddhism we talk about the well-being of all sentient beings. And in fact, we use this affectionate word, all mother sentient beings. Right? So the concept is there. But the problem is how to implement this concept. So therefore it is really, really important to engage in proper listening to proper text, proper teacher, and then teacher also. You know, if you just just if you are just going to listen to somebody just like you are doing today with my talk, you don't have to accept me as your teacher, that's fine. You are just you came here and just you are listening to a lecture. But but if you really want to have somebody as your teacher, take time, take a little bit of time, ask other people about the integrity of that person, knowledge of that person, more importantly, compassion of that person, things like that. On the one hand, it's true that you will not get a completely enlightened Buddha as your teacher in this time of degeneration, but at least somebody who will not cheat you, who is compassionate. Okay, that's very important, especially when you enter into Buddhist practice, right? And then the Buddhist teaching must be understood in its proper context. There are some so-called teachers and lamas who may not be able to explain everything and they would say, 
once you make connection to me as my your teacher, you just do whatever I say. You just do whatever I say, otherwise you will go to Vajra hell. They have a source. They have a source in the text. There are such things like there. But that is in a totally different context. It's primarily in the tantric context with the special features and qualifications to be fulfilled. You can't just say somebody going to Vajra hell because of not following you whatever you say. And especially if you are not so good te- teacher, how can you follow everything? And many number of people have actually faced that problem and came to see me asking their question, you know, what, what should I deal with this one? This teacher has been very nice to me. Now he is very nasty. He is cheating me, doing these things, bad things, you know. What should I do? I said, those good parts, remain good. remember those good parts as good parts. Thank you. Now this bad part is bad part. Just go away. Use your common sense. Use your common sense. And then I give this very compelling example, I hope. He's saying, you know, normally people, you know, they're in a way very, very gullible. I tell them, if your teacher says, jump from the ninth story and commit suicide, will you do? I don't think people will do. Maybe one or two lunatics will be there. I mean, there's no, 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 <laughs> no shortage of <laughs> lunatics also. You know, they may do, but generally they will not do. So similarly, you don't have to, you know, it's clearly mentioned in the text that if the Lama says something which, which doesn't, you know, look right, you have every right to talk gently to that person. I'm not able to practice this. Or will you please explain me this further? You know? So, so in all human relations, including your relation to the Lama, use your common sense. Nobody can force you to do anything. Okay? Uh, if you have sex with me, you will go to heaven. Such things have happened. I'm, I'm saying this because such things have happened. And people believe in that and live with their lama. Where is the heaven? There may be, there may be a baby. I mean, really, this are, this are, maybe, maybe you're aspiring for money or prestige and go with these people, you know, get lured and hooked, you know. So, so don't, don't do this. Use your common sense. In the Buddhist teaching, using your common sense. Critical thinking is very, very important. You don't have to get angry or develop hatred to that person. If it is something that you can't do, just say. Or don't say anything. Just go away. Many people ask me, you know, I, I, I want to have a good teacher. Gishila, can you please suggest? I always say, he's holding this Dalai Lama. Because there's no risk there. And also many people think if somebody is your teacher, he or she has to live with you as if it is your commodity. Your teacher is not your commodity. Students are not the commodity of the teacher. You see? Right? Right? So therefore the important thing is listen to the teaching of the Lama or teacher. Right? And make good use of it. Number of people have also come to me and said, Gishila, can you be please my teacher? I said, yes, I'll be teacher. Bring a rope. Rasi, you know, Rasi. Bring a rope and we'll tie our head together and jump from the cliff. You know, I, I, I used to tell them that, you know, if there's any beneficial thing that I can help you teach, I will be happy to teach you. But there, but there is no, 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 not much use of, you know, blindly tying oneself to others. Purchase. <laughs> Kids. Right? So therefore, don't, don't just uh, go for a teacher with uh, superficial appearances. Don't just get attracted to the superficial appearance. Take time. In the Buddhist text it says it, the meeting with the teacher should not be, or accepting somebody as the teacher should not be just like a dog jumping onto a lump of meat. You know, if you throw a lump of meat in front of a dog, the dog has no time to test 
It will immediately gravitate and eat it. Don't do that. Take time. Take time. Examine it. Even in the text clearly says, even when you buy a horse, you need to spend a lot of time. How, how old the horse is? Is it useful? What is the condition of the teeth? And things like that. So similarly, when you're looking for a teacher, take time. Don't just run after somebody because that, that teacher is very famous and has many followers. That's not an indication that he's a good teacher. He may be famous, not necessarily a good teacher. So therefore, we, in Buddhism, we talk about four reliances. Four reliances. Do not rely on the teacher, I mean primarily. Do not rely primarily on the teacher, but rely on his teaching. Not on the person, but on the teaching. Person may be famous, not famous, but important thing is teaching. Now when it comes to the teaching, pay more attention to the meaning of the teaching than the beauty of the words. And when it comes to understand the meaning, rely more on the definitive meaning, ultimate meaning, than on the interpretative meaning. <coughs> when it comes to understanding the definitive or ultimate meaning, rely more on the pristine consciousness, wisdom consciousness, not on the gross consciousness. So these are the processes of relying on the teaching. Right? So that's important. Okay. So now let us talk a little bit about how to, how to do the meditation. Now you know, yesterday we spoke about the five, six, sorry, six preparatory practices. So similarly, if you want to cultivate calm abiding, shamat, special insight, vipassana, then it is important first to accumulate the necessary contributing causes. Number one, the course number one is restraining your senses. Restraining your senses. In today's world, as I already mentioned, that we don't restrain our senses. Our senses run wild. And we run after all the sensual objects and we become busy and have no time. We get completely distracted and no time for meditation. So restrain your senses. Restraining, how will you restrain your senses? How can you restrain your senses? You can restrain your senses by being mindful, by recollecting, by being aware of all your activities. What am I doing? Where am, where am I looking? To which direction I'm walking? You know, what am I saying? Be mindful and restrain your senses. So there's, there's the, the factor by which you can restrain your senses. And that restraining senses should be done with respect and with constant practice. With respect and constant practices. Again, here only you can't do this practice with short-lived attempt. And therefore you should recollect all those teachings which will help you restrain your senses. And what is being restrained is the six senses. Is there five senses or six senses? Five or six senses? Six. six. The Buddhists will say six senses. The others will say five senses. Six, sixth sense, there is a movie called Sixth Sense. This movie came about because sixth sense means, wow, is there a sixth sense? It's like magic, miraculous, you know. When we organize many of these science programs, and this institute makes a lot of science exhibitions also, when we prepared the first exhibition, it was on the five senses. So some of the scientists and our monks, they were preparing the five senses, you know, the exhibition for the five senses. So I went there and said, no, 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 six senses. The science teachers, they were like dumbfounded. They said, what? So we talk about six senses. Okay? Six senses. Here also it says, six senses. Restraining the six senses. 
From, from what area one should restrain the six senses? Restrain one's six senses from the six sensual objects. Six sensual objects. Like for the eye, the physical form. For the ear, the sound. For the nose, the smell. For the body, the touch. For the tongue, the taste. And for the mind, of course, there are so many objects of the mind. So especially in today's world, restraining the five or six senses is very important. Right? The Buddha at one point he said, the world is on fire. The world is aflame. The world is on fire because the senses are on fire. Burning. The eye sense is burning towards the physical form and so forth. Now this you can clearly see today if you visit a big mall. I've been telling people that the big malls are more or less structured on the needs of people who chase the six sensual objects. So if you count the floors of the mall, one will be form, physical form. The television screens in which there is display of many interesting Bollywood, Hollywood actor, actresses, you know, form. And then you go to the next floor, it will be sound, CDs and all kind of, you know, discs, right? Japanese music, Chinese music, American music, so many different kinds of music. Go to the next floor, scents. Normally scents are on the ground floor. I've noticed that. Scents, all kinds of senses of made up from this flower, that flower, you know. Fragrance. Uh, then, next floor, restaurants. For the tongue, Chinese restaurant, Japanese restaurant, Indian restaurant, Tibetan restaurant, things like that. And then, next floor, touch, clothes. Clothes, also many varieties now, men, women, and kids, you know, there are so many sections of clothes. I, 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 I have not only read the books, but I ventured and saw all these things, you see. <laughs> right? So, so what I'm trying to say is, these people who do business, they are not stupid. They are very clever in making money. So in making money, they, they see what, what is fashion, prevailing fashion. What is it that people are running after today? Right? So they saw basically people are running after six sensual objects. Here, the mall. The mall came like that. Now the problem is when you go into this big mall, in addition to your great obsession with the six sensual objects, and you finally move into the mall where you're able to see all those sensual objects there, you get completely lost. You become, you know, you're, you're in a coma. We call it shopping coma. Shopping coma. It really happens, shopping coma. Okay? And then they have arranged everything in so beautifully, so nicely. Buy one, one free. Then there is a layer of baskets lying there, you know. The fellow who moves in front of you takes one basket. And then you should also imitate them and take one basket because you are not less than anybody. You want to prove that, right? And then you cannot just keep on walking, taking one empty basket, especially when you see buy one, one free, or two free, something like that. Oh, then you put something there. Right? You are still in coma. So like this, and then finally when you give the money also, you have not much idea how much money will be taken away because you don't give physical money, you give just plastic card. And most of us are not sure how, many, how much money is there in your plastic card. The machine just, with a swab, it takes away your money. Then give you the bill, and then you pack everything, go back. It's only after you reach home, you come back to your senses. You're out of the coma. Then you realize, why the hell I bought this one? I already have this one. Am I telling lie, or have you experienced things like that? 
And this is a new, not a new phenomena. This is there in ancient Tibetan text. Tumsi cigarette, not the Tumsi, the Tibetan word, ancient Tibetan text. I, I, I read this, you know, in a magazine, the shopping coma thing. Then I was reading a mind training text, you know, ancient mind training Tibetan text. It exactly has the same word, Tumsi, that means market intoxication. Where, where some parents, they just lose their child, you know. So that's what I'm saying. So, so, so what I'm trying to drive at is that if you're not, not able to concentrate, if you're not able to be mindful, you can be easily carried away by the, by the you know, glamorous presentation that is outside there in the world. Market is just one thing. But wherever you go, there is attraction everywhere. So many things. Almost like, come, 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 come. I'm here, come, 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 you know. So unless you have that kind of integrity, right? So therefore, if you want to do a successful meditation, one of the first thing is restrain your senses. Restrain your senses with mindfulness. Restrain your senses from the five or six sensual objects. And that also you should do continuously. Hmm. Now, how to protect yourself? your five, five senses. The way to protect your five senses is when there is this meeting of the five, six sensual objects and the five, six senses, then six consciousness, the eye consciousness, ear consciousness, and so forth arise, and which is concluded by the development of mental consciousness. And it is this mental consciousness which says, this is interesting. This is nice. This is wonderful. And based on that, or, or you will say, this is horrible, this is ugly, this is distasteful. So depending upon what that mental consciousness decides, you will either develop attachment or you develop hatred. Right? So at the, at the end of the day, the reason that we develop that attachment or develop that hatred is because of our exposure to the six sensual objects. So right in the beginning, if you restrain your senses and not expose yourself, or not make yourself susceptible to these six sensual objects, you will not become vulnerable to that. That is how you protect yourself. So at the end of the day, the point is not to let your mind develop hatred, attachment, anger, and so forth. So therefore, especially when we talk about restraining your senses, make sure that your senses do not engage in object which will produce attachment, which will produce anger, which will produce jealousy and so forth. Right? If you just look at an ordinary mat, it's not a big issue. But if you look at a fancy car, there may be an issue, you see, things like that. And especially when you let your senses engage in the sen sensual objects, make sure that the mind does not grasp the sensual objects as having independent, inherent existence. This is fantastic. This is so good. I really need this. That is, that is what, what we say. That's why there, there, there are so many advertisements, you know. You see this advertisement, then there are many people I've seen writing comments, oh, I really need this. Oh, I really need this. So that should not be there. Of course, they will, you may need it, but don't see it as, the, as an everlasting source of peace and happiness. You can use it for temporary benefit, but don't, don't grasp at it. Don't obsess with it. That is the point. Okay? And then the next important point before you meditate is Engage consciously. 
Don't don't move around as if you are you are a zombie. Move around with full full awareness, full alertness. She is into Java. Engage knowingly. We we have this wonderful mind and wonderful senses. Use them. You know what is proper, what is improper. Analyze it with full awareness. Just like His Holiness the Dalai Lama. You know, I've seen. I worked with him for 16 years. He's not only good in you know spiritual teachings and things like that, but he's always fully alert and aware. You know, I remember very clearly. You know, there are number of uh, switches there. You know, buttons there. So sometimes you don't need this light, that light, then, or you need that light. Then his holiness would say, put the light on. Then some of us will go down. There are, there are five, six, you know, buttons. We are not sure which one, so we press every one and see which one is the right one. His holiness would immediately say, no, no, the third one, or the fourth one, precisely. That is not his job, you know. <laughs> But because being alert, he knows. Okay, this switch is for this light. This switch is for this light. Then very often he would, you know, if there is a somebody doing a video taping. Or taking a photo, he would say, "Oh, your your the your your camera is not on." You know, so that kind of alertness must be there. Alertness, awareness, as we say, is very very important. If you have that, you can learn many things very easily, very quickly. And I've been telling people, like for example, this these flowers. There's so many. Number of flowers we have around the library, and the library staffs have been you know, moving around this now now so many fifteen twenty years, including myself, but we have, we don't know the names of the flowers because we are not alert, not aware. Right, so it's really important to ask questions. What is this? Which season this flower grows? What is the best time for pruning or whatever you know all those things? Then everything everything. Is a learning experience. So, engaging knowingly means, in what field you are engaging, or what is the process by which you are engaging. It talks about like five activities, including walking, moving. For example, the physical number one is the physical action. Physical action means physically you go to town, you go to temples, or you go to here and there. Maintain mindfulness where you are going. And then the the function of the eye. There are two ways of seeing things. One is without thinking. Just things come in the purview of your eye. Then there is a second level where you plan and think about what to see, and then accordingly you see that object. So there also <coughs> you have control what to see, what not to see. I, I, I have been repeatedly saying that the problem with us is that we normally keep on seeing what we want to see, not what we should be seeing. You see. So that's what is precisely saying. <clears throat> Then similarly, your stretching hand, stretching legs, in all these activities, you should maintain mindfulness. And then, putting on cloth. You see, <laughs> I've seen some people who are so careless. You know, they will they'll wear shoes without thinking. They put their leg under the bed. And just without looking, just put the, put on the shoes and 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 then come out, and then you will find that person is wearing one one foot wearing the red, you know, shoes, another black shoes. It really happened, you know. Some people are so kind of careless, so you need to be careful. Mm. Then in the case of monks, the the begging bowls, the religious robes. Then the then the the action of going for arms, and then going to the temple, 
then the action of your speech, your mind, and then the activities that you should do in the day, activities that you should do in the night, and so forth. So in short, engaging consciously means that whatever activities or movements that you are going to do, right in the beginning, you should maintain mindfulness and with heedfulness, carefulness, engage in that object. I think this is enough. <clears throat> then for a meditator, you should also have some moderation in your food. Moderation in food means if you take very little food, you will get tired and you will not be able to meditate. Your body will also become very thin and weak and you will have no power in engaging in any kind of virtuous practices. So make sure that you will not remain hungry until the next time for the food. Contrarily, if you overeat, then you, you will feel as if you are carrying a heavy load and you will experience that heaviness and difficulty in breathing, you know, and that will increase your mental torpor, become lethargic, and you will, you will be overpowered by sleep, right? And then also the food you take should be something that is digestible, and something that is suitable to you. Otherwise, again, you will have stomach problem, you see. If your stomach is rumbling, how can you <laughs> meditate? You need to frequently run to the bathroom. And then the food you should take also be not polluted, in the sense the food you are eating should not be, should not be something that you've earned by fooling and cheating other people through bribing, through corruption. And then also, when you eat food, do not uh, have too much attachment because as soon as we chew the food, when it comes into the mouth and chew the food, it's already become dirty. It's already like, almost like a vomit, you know. And then especially when it goes down, finally comes out in the form of excretion, you see. So this is what is, this is the result of your food. So there is not much point in developing too much attachment to the food. The food, as Nagarjuna says in his letter to the friend, the food should be taken as a medicine. You don't take too much medicine. Stomach full medicine. You never take a stomach full medicine. Right? And also for medicine, I don't think you will develop too much attachment, less attachment to medicine than for food. Right? Mm. And take your food without attachment, without obsession, without hatred. Hatred means, for example, if you, if you have destroyed your enemy, then you engage in looting. Then you voraciously eat the food, you know. This is what I got from my enemy. Let us enjoy. So this is out of hatred and anger should not be like this, or attachment, you know. And then also think about how much effort we have to make to get food. In order to get food, you need to tolerate it. heat, cold, so many things. Look at the farmers, look at the fishermen, okay. And then it is also in relation to the food that there will be misunderstanding, fighting, even among the relatives, among the same family members. 
And then there is also this drawback of having no contentment. We keep on eating, you know, for so many years. There's not much contentment, you see. And it is because of this lack of contentment and obsession with the food. Now, now many people, you, will, you know, they are, they are overweight. And their, 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 their legs are not able to carry their body. You see. So for one's physical health also, it's very important to have this moderation. And it is because, because of this obsession with the food, sometimes you lose your freedom. Like when you join an army or things like that, then you have to do whatever the bosses say. Go to the war. Go to the killing field and get killed. You see. And then how many negative deeds that we do? physical negative deeds, verbal negative deeds, mental negative deeds, in order to get this food. Right? Okay, now we, I stop here. Some, some questions? Yeah. Speak louder. In the context of the four noble truths, yeah. it's written, the Buddha says, know the sufferings, although there is nothing to know, relinquish the cause of misery, although there is nothing to relinquish. Yeah, yeah. What's the actual meaning of this? The actual meaning is, you know, when Buddha first gave the, uh, turned the wheel of doctrine, which is called the, uh, you know, teaching on the four noble truths, the Buddha said, this is true suffering. This is true origin of suffering. Uh, this is true cessation. This is true path. Then in the second round he said, suffering should be known. Origin of suffering must be eliminated. Cessation must be actualized. Path must be meditated. Then during the third round he said, although suffering is to be known, there is nothing to know. Although the origin of suffering must be eliminated, but there is nothing to eliminate. Although cessation has to be actualized, but there is nothing to actualize. Although the path must be meditated, but there is nothing to meditate. That means two meaning. One, although suffering must be eliminated, but there is no suffering which has inherent existence. There is no suffering which has you know, inherent existence which is to be eliminated. In a conventional sense, they are there, but they don't have inherent existence. There's one meaning, which is applicable to all the rest. Similarly, the second meaning is, although suffering must be known, but when you get completely enlightened and become a Buddha, there is no suffering to know, because the Buddha has no suffering. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah, louder, louder. Uh, uh, in the context of Shabbatha, yeah. it is written that besides it bears many other resources. So for instance, almost all the knowledge of three yana, one Shravakayana, two Satpukayana, and three Mahayana are derived from Shamad Bhagna. And then uh, it was not explained what is Shravakayana and Satpukayana. And the Mahayana, is, does that mean the same Mahayana tradition? Yeah. We, we talk about three vehicles. Sarvakayana vehicle, Pratika Buddha vehicle, and Mayana vehicle. So this is talking about this. Vehicles, three vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. This is Kamala Shila's stages of meditation, this book. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, in your book, this push uh, got me enlightened. Yeah. Uh, it was written uh, about like having harmony with the body, mind, yeah. uh, feelings, and phenomena. Yeah. I don't understand the harmony, how to have the harmony with the phenomena. What does it mean by that? 
hopefully we will speak a little bit about this tomorrow when we talk about mindfulness when we talk about mindfulness we are talking about mindfulness of one's body lutem banyarya mindfulness of one's feeling sarvatham banyarya mindfulness of the mind samtham banyarya and mindfulness of the rest of the phenomena chutam banyarya okay now all these three levels of object on which we maintain mindfulness none of them have inherent existence they are same in having no inherent existence in that sense so when you maintain that that mindfulness practice there are two ways of doing it one is reflecting on their general characteristics and then on the specific characteristics spe- specific features of each of this uh, for phenomena okay not so clear like how to have harmony with the phenomena like you're talking about uh, being mindful or aware about the phenomena yeah and here it is written uh, like having harmony yeah harmony harmony means to to see them as they are okay okay see them as they are if if they exist in one way and we see it in another way there's no harmony yeah don't make friendship with okay there's a tibetan saying which says don't make friendship with okay any other questions Yesterday about anger, you mentioned that I thought you did. Speak louder. About Sahili's question yesterday about anger, I thought you said, which might not be right, that if you can't find the target, you won't get angry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is the point not to want to look for the target, or the point is that you, um, like, What comes first? Do you want to get rid of your anger or you want to get rid of the target? No, no here the, the important thing is there's a very beautiful teaching in Shanti Deva's Bodhisattva way of life where when it comes to the question of stopping anger it says starve the anger because anger is your, your enemy. So to defeat the enemy don't continue to supply food to anger starve the anger and what is what is the food of anger the food for anger is unhappiness of mind when the mind is unhappy you get angry so that unhappiness of the mind is the food for the anger right so therefore in many of my talks and teachings i've at almost at the end of the teaching i've always been telling people that you should make a pledge by saying whatever may come in my life i will never make my mind unhappy I mean, this is a of course not an easy commitment but this is a very important commitment so so my point is i mean this do, does not directly answer your question so what i'm tr- trying to say is anger comes with different causes and factors major cause or main cause is unhappiness of the mind Now here in this specific question that you are asking that you get angry because you have this tendency to blame somebody that I'm I'm angry there's a reason for me to get angry because of him because of her because of the heat of the sun so you need a target one target so what I was saying yesterday was This is wrong because the 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 unhappiness the unpleasant experience that you are giving the anger you are getting is not due to just one factor it's due to many factors so if you instead of thinking on just one target one factor if you think about all the causes and conditions i mean too many to blame you see too many to blame Nobody would get angry by saying 
I'm angry with these 7 billion people of this world, or now 8 billion people of this world, because it's too much, you know. No specific target. So therefore, normally, you get angry because you, you tend to blame it just on one person, one object. He is the mischievous person. And thank you for asking this question because I want to say a very important thing here. If you look at the tendency of these negative emotions, there's another very interesting thing, I think, difference between positive emotions and negative emotions. Positive emotions are normally open-minded. They're more expensive. They're more welcoming. They're more embracing. Negative emotions are narrow-minded. Here is the example. In the case of anger, narrow-minded, just one, one to one person. Similarly, when you develop excessive attachment, you just want to one person. This is the person I love. This is the person I love, not anybody. I, I can die for this person. You see? Narrow-minded. Whereas loving kindness never say, just this person. May all sentient beings be happy. You see? So with this kind of, this kind of thinking, is, as His Holiness says very clearly, this kind of thinking is liberating. It will free you. The negative ways of thinking will suffocate you. If you don't believe, I'll give you an example. When you get angry, don't you get suffocated? Don't you get, have problems of breathing? People who are angry, they say, yeah, last time also you, you know, you said these things. <laughs> Today also you are, you know, what's the problem with you? <laughs> you see? Am I a good, good joker? <laughs> really, this, you know, you, you have difficulty breathing. When you develop fear, not to say dua, men are papa in a chiana chuna, nying kani tunes like dua. When we say, my heart came out from my mouth, when you have fear, meaning that when you have fear, you can't breathe. Therefore, the breathing just comes from the mouth, you know, doesn't go down. There, you see. So for your, for your health, physical health, mental health, the positive emotions are liberating, freeing. When you develop these negative emotions, when these negative emotions are there, you know, you, you feel that you are suffocating, you are, you are under bondage. When develop this, for example, when you think just about yourself, when you develop very strong self-cherishing attitude, I, me, and mine, this is now said to be the main source of all kind of physical illnesses. I, me, and mine. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. When you continue to make these self-references, you get all kinds of diseases, including heart attack. This is scientifically proved. They said in the Buddhist text a long time back, now it's scientifically you know, proved. Instead, when you talk about many more other people, develop altruistic attitude, you don't get these kind of problems and diseases. You see? Because when you make this you know, references, I, me, and mine. Again, your mind is narrow. I, me, mine. And when you have this very narrow focus, within this narrow focus, you are able to see only yourself. I am the only miserable fellow on this earth. Everybody is happy. Everybody is enjoying. Look at me. Nobody is taking care of me. Nobody loves me, you know? Which is not true, but this is how you think then you really become that miserable fellow. Right? So this is very interesting. These negative emotions are like narrow-minded. They want attachment, as I said, anger, as I said. Just one target. One small hub question. Have a question, yeah. Um, I always confuse between mind and heart. 
when are we talking about the mind the body, the mind things like it becomes conscious, or when are we talking about the mind fullness, or um, the mind becomes tall, things like. So is there any difference between thought and mind? No, there will be differences in language, you know. In in Tibetan Buddhist <coughs> text, in Tibetan Buddhist text, we say sem sem da ye da nam hi sum thayonchik. Sem ye nam hi consciousness mind, and then probably thought they are synonymous. Ewa thayonchik, but then if you use the English word, I don't know. They may may they may make some differences. But sometimes when you use the word thought. Uh, people use this thought as more on the conception level. Within mind, there is conceptual and non-conceptual mind. So very often people use thought as on the conceptual level. But depends, you know, how you interpret it in different contexts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. See you tomorrow. <laughs>